today. 80% of businesses don't sell. To be a part of the 20% that do, and at maximum value, you'll need a successful strategy. Welcome to the Defenders of Business Value podcast, where we interview today's top professional advisors who help business owners create, preserve, and most importantly, transfer value. If you want actionable tips that will increase your business value, stay tuned. The podcast starts now with your host, Ed Mysogland. I had the opportunity today to visit with Mike Michalowicz. Mike is the author of Profit First, and this is the the book that I was introduced to him um, by. And that book, it kind of turns a business on its head. So basically, a business has revenue, less expenses, equal profit. In Profit First, it's just the other way around. It's revenue, less profit equals expenses. And so it was, it was a fascinating interview with him about, you know, how inadvertently the profit first methodology not only increases the business value from, from earning standpoint, but it also forces the business owner to look at their operating expenses in a way that they, they hadn't ever before. So I hope you enjoy my visit with Mike McAllowitz. I'm your host, Ed Mysigland. I teach business owners how to build value and identify and remove risks in their business so that one day they can sell at maximum value when they want, how they want, and to whom they want. On today's show, I'm delighted and excited to welcome Mike McCallowitz. Mike is the author of five books, including Clockwork, Profit First, Surge, The Pumpkin Plan, and The Toilet Paper Entrepreneur, and is a former small business columnist for The Wall Street Journal. He is the Business Rescue segment host for MSNBC's Your Business. He hosted the reality television program called Bailout. Mike has appeared on NBC, MSNBC, Fox News, ABC News, CNBC, On the Money, and Pat Croce's Down to Business. He has lectured on entrepreneurship, sales, and behavioral marketing techniques at universities, corporations, and organizations. And lastly, he's the host of his own podcast, The entrepreneurship elevated podcast so welcome to the show mike edwin thank you so much for inviting me you know it's it's a delight to have you on the show and i had read profit first i had i had uh, i got introduced to you by ray the ray edwards show and it's so mm -hmm. hard to to figure out where to start because you have such an extensive body of knowledge but i know that the books and the things that you're doing in your practice you know, they've all been road tested. So can you kind of give us a, a little high level overview of, of how you got here? Because I know it, it hasn't yeah. always been great. Oh, no, no. And I guess that's the human journey, right? I don't think anyone's had the perfect life. Um, but I, I've been an entrepreneur for the entirety of my adult life ever since college, came out of college. I actually had a job for a short period, but uh, realized I'm not suited for that and have been an entrepreneur uh, ever since. But it was uh, about 11 years ago that I uh, had the great epiphany, it was kind of thrust upon me, that even though I had built and sold now a, a couple of multi-million dollar companies, a, a, five, a Fortune 500 acquisition, a private equity deal too, I, uh, I knew nothing about entrepreneurship. Um, I, my journey, I, I covered the tracks of kind of the struggles I had. I was never profitable running those businesses and it was just some brutal times tearing my hair out just dying to, to cover payroll and, um, realize I, I didn't know much about entrepreneurship and I endeavored, uh, on this particular moment that I would really understand what makes an entrepreneur successful, what makes the journey simpler and, uh, became an author to do that. So uh, for the last 11 years, I've been a full-time author devoted to small business owners, to entrepreneurs. And I tried to look at every element of business to fix it. And honestly, every book I've written, we, we, I know we're going to talk about profit first. Every book I've written has been really initially rooted in my own struggles. I did not know how profitability worked. I, I thought I did. I, I studied all the books. I, I had a finance degree, but I had no clue on how profit really worked. And so I, I created a system for myself, implemented in my own businesses. My businesses, I, I own four now. They're all guinea pigs of mine. I, I implemented And sure enough, um, I found a solution 11 years ago. Uh, tested it, then rolled out to other companies, and five years ago started writing it into a book. And I've done the same thing with business efficiency, um, sales, um, and, and my newest book is is working. I think on one of the greatest dilemmas entrepreneurs have. So that's uh, 
that's how I came an author. Well, you know, and it's a great segue because four of the five books that I mentioned in the introduction, you seem to be looking at the entire life cycle of the business. So toilet paper entrepreneur focuses on starting and keeping a business running. That's right. The pumpkin plan teaches you how to be a first class company. That's right. Clockwork teaches you to move from operator to investor and then profit first is about maximizing profitability. So you almost have the complete life cycle. Now that this show and, and what I've dedicated 30 years of my, my life to is, is toward the end. And, you know, intrinsically all of your, all of your work helps business owners increase value. I think just by virtue of, of deploying what you teach does that. But what are your, what are your thoughts on valuation in the work you're doing and how, how does this translate? So I, you know, it's funny. I think the most valuable business in the world is one that you love so much you would never sell it, because that becomes the prettiest girl to dance. <laughs> right. um, I, you know, I've been through two exits, and I went through one exit um, and was in a, posi- a weak position because I I didn't need to exit, um, but. I felt this desperation because the business wasn't functioning well. And that's when it's hard to negotiate. But another situation where the uh, Fortune 500 approached us and said, hey, we want this. And now you become um, desirable. But when when you really have no interest in selling, um, you become highly valuable. But now there's some components. Why wouldn't you want to sell? Well, if you create a cash ATM, if that machine is running on automatic, why would you ever want to sell it? Because it's making money for you. Right. And that becomes now a very valuable business. If it gives you joy and, and it gives you satisfaction in life, well, why would you ever want to get rid of it? That brings more value. So um, I think to, if you want to have an extraordinary exit, just create a business that's extraordinary for you, that you love every component of it. And that will position you super well. And, and I was funny, I, I was at a conference, um, it's called gathering of Titans. Um, honestly, between me and you, sometimes it's really gathering of egos, but uh, <laughs> it's, it's, you know, there's some really successful businesses in there. There's household name businesses in there. And I joined this conference 15 years ago. It's invite only. There's a hundred people that go. I've been going for 15, 16 years now. And we had a VC come in once and he's um, talked about uh, selling. And he says, uh, who here's sold a business? And uh, these are, you know, some of these are household names. Maybe, 20% of the hands went up and that is the odd scenario. You know, if you ask a hundred entrepreneurs randomly off the street who sold a business, I bet you half of a hand goes up one alligator claw. Like most businesses will never sell. Um, so we shouldn't have this pipe dream that if, if we build it, they will come. We should build it. So we want to come there every single day. And that way, if that potential inevitability comes that you can't sell your business, well, congratulations, you've built it around what brings you joy and brings you a cash ATM anyway. So you're golden. Yeah. But to have this kind of pipe dream that you'll sell a business and, and be in this desperate mode, that's super dangerous. Yeah. And, and uh, the statistics are, are, are dismal. I mean, it's, it's 25, 30% success ratio of, of actually being able, able to sell the business. And, and that's what we always, we teach, you know, if, holding on to the business, that's an exit strategy. And, and that's what I think the wonderful things that you you're teaching in your books is build it for yourself. And yeah. somebody will view it as a valuable asset when you go to exit it, you know, but at the end of the day, that's your business. You design it the way you want and let the chips fall where they may, but just do it on a conscious level, as opposed to letting the market, you know, dictate your value you should be able to identify the owner's value, so to speak, you know, In, you know, this desperation, I mean, it's not the right word, but this maybe overwhelming desire is a better word to sell a business often reverts to shortcuts and ignoring business fundamentals. When I was wanted to sell a business, I went to this mode of like, wow, we got to, we got to pump this thing up. We got to get some real sales rolling in because we got to show a sales trajectory to prove a trend. And, uh, you know, they're going to look at our bottom line. So we better cut costs and let's go bare bones. And so now I have a business that is trying to grow aggressively, but I'm cutting down the infrastructure as I'm trying to build up a sales number, which puts it in a real precarious position. You know, sophisticated investors, um, actually any investor because they're spending their own money is going to be probably pretty cautious when they see that in the last year before selling the business, you've gone for this sales trajectory and growth and you're cutting costs. 
They know the game you're playing. These people aren't stupid and, and they know that they're buying an unhealthy business. I, I think one of the craziest risky strategies that owners take is carrying the business on their back. You see this with small business, you know, these sub $10 million businesses, the owner does everything. The entire business is in their head. They work ridiculous hours. They can answer any situation and are, are the superhero swooping in to save the business yet again. That is the worst valued business ever. I, I do not want to buy a business that has any dependency on the owner. Because the day I buy it, if that owner is sick or decides not to show up, I'm screwed. So the value is in a business that's truly turnkey, that the, the owner is... It's just the owner. Right. You know, you know, when I go, and this has been a, a research project of mine uh, recently. I'll, I'll probably include this in a future book. I, I uh, admittedly go to McDonald's um, <laughs> when I travel and I'm not proud of that fact, but it is awfully convenient. But I started this research project, project. When I go to a McDonald's, I'll ask the cashier, I'll say, hey, may I speak with the owner briefly? I'm impressed by your operations. Want to have a conversation with them. I have, I've done this over a hundred times. I've yet to have one single visit where the cashier says, oh yeah, yeah, let me grab the owner. The owner is not in that glorified closet they call an office. Mm -hmm. That's the store manager. The, the, the owner is not you know, flipping burgers or, or cooking fries and they're not running the cash register. I, I went to one cashier when I said, may I speak with the owner? They said, um, I, don't, I don't know who the owner is. And I went to another one once who said, oh yeah, I met the owner two months ago. They came in to pick up the money. Like <laughs> that's the job of an owner yeah. is to create a system that's so tight that there's no dependency on them. And uh, kudos to McDonald's is a franchise model. The system has been created and you can buy into the system, but we should all aspire to have a business where our only responsibility is to come in and pick up the money. That is a very valuable business. Yeah. You know, the funny thing is that when, and it's, and it's not funny and it, it is the challenge that every business owner owner faces. And I, I've received a number of emails because I don't want to say I minimize this, but some of the guests have said, you know, this is what you need to do. And, and their response is, okay, I get it. How am I supposed to not be the owner? How do I, you know, how do I get through that valley from owner to investor and, and, yeah. and overseer? So how, how do you do that? Yeah. So I, I devoted a book to this process. Clockwork, yeah. yeah. Clockwork, right. It, it, the subtitles design your business to run itself. Uh, I will tell you uh, the path, but I'll also tell you it's not a switch. I met with uh, my author hero about three years ago. We shared a main stage in Mexico. His name is Michael Gerber. He wrote the book E-Myth yeah. and he shares a simple concept. Don't work in the business, work on the business. And I sat down with him. I said, Michael, your, your book is the authority read on systems. But I said, there's one problem that I think I have had. And I think many readers have with this concept of on, not in is that I thought it was a switch. I thought if I worked in my business long enough and hard enough, one day I could just step out of it. That finally be working that way. And I, we had a discussion around this, but really what the conclusion is, it's a throttle. You extract yourself from a business. In fact, there's a terminology that we often use as entrepreneurs saying that we have a parent child relationship. I, I'm the parent of my business. My business is the child. I will nurture it and care for it and grow it. And at a certain point, have its own legs under itself and it will come back and return to me. It'll serve me. And I call bullshit on that term. Um, I don't, I don't think it's a parent child relationship. I think we are conjoined twins with our business <laughs> right. and sure. you know, we share critical organs. Our, our, our veins and arteries are connected. Um, we share a heart, we share a soul. And therefore the separation of the owner from their business is often a very careful, careful surgical process, just like conjoined twins. You don't do this and just kind of separate the, the two. You have to be very careful not to sever arteries and, and, and critical organs. You must be very uh, selective, surgical and, and, and focused and do this over a period of time. Well, the same is true for our business. What we need to do uh, is, is first own a new title. So this is the pathway to get there. I, I love entrepreneurship. Every book I write is about entrepreneurship. I, I, sadly, I'm starting to get a little bit of a distaste for the word or title entrepreneur. And the reason is it's become so bastardized recently. Uh, entrepreneur has been equated to this hustle and grind mentality, which is the worst mentality in the world. Uh, hustle and grind, which says, you know, you got to show up and crank every single day if you want your business to be successful. Well, th that's the epitome of growing a business that carry, is being carried on your back. Um, that's a bit, uh, the epitome of a business that is of no value because it, it's fully based upon the entrepreneur's sweat. Now, 
I understand the sentiment of hustle and grind. You, listen, it's, this is not an easy job. You have to work for it. But the goal is to be very smart about it, not to be, uh, you know, muscle your way through business growth. It is to be very tactical around this. And so I believe that what we need to do is choreograph the resources around us, organize uh, our people, the systems uh, we have, our clients, even our, our vendors to move us toward a common outcome. That's our vision for our business. So it is much more a strategic role as opposed to a muscle role. Um, so th th to do this, we need to change that title. So this is the first step. For God's sake, stop calling yourself an entrepreneur. And, and I've done this recently. Um, this was a, is hard to do, but the next time you're at a, you know, a dinner party or talking with some friends that don't know you and, and uh, so well yet and say, what do you do for a living? Please don't say you're an entrepreneur because that translates internally to, I work my tail off. I actually say I'm a shareholder. So when people say, what do you do? Say, oh, I'm a shareholder of four small businesses. Uh, and they say, well, what does that mean? And now I say, well, you know, a shareholder, just like if you own public stock, that means I render a, a vote in my business. I, I, I dictate its uh, high end direction, but I don't work for the business. I, I manage the business. So when I say I'm a shareholder, that puts me in the mentality of acting like a shareholder, giving a strategic direction, uh, voting for maybe even sitting on the board, but not doing the work. Now, I'm not saying tomorrow you're not going to do any work, but at least you got to start owning this mentality. A micro business needs all the resources it can get, and you may be the resource, but realize you are serving a temporary role. Your role is to be acting like a shareholder first and foremost, and to fill that role as long as it's healthy for the business by get hiring other people and putting other people in that position. So the goal is, again, this that, that's a very overarching, simple thing you can do immediately, but will have a major mind shift for you. I found extracting ourselves from a business that we're ingrained in can be done for most businesses in under two years, maybe a year and a half. Most businesses, we can extract ourselves out. And as we do this, um, we will rely more and more on, on the systemization of the business, just like McDonald's does and anything else. W one last thing that just came to mind that I want to share. I've interviewed now hundreds of entrepreneurs that have gone from doing work to extracting themselves. And one of my favorites is this guy, Mike Aguilaria. He ran a uh, electric, he's an electrician, ran this electrical contracting company, which he sold uh, last year for $28 million cash on the barrelhead. And um, he started off in one van. And I said, what was one of the most strategic things you did? Now he started by working in the business. He said, I, ch I changed the questions. Uh, one day I woke up after working another you know, 12 hour day uh, installing electrical panels and lights and stuff. And he said, instead of asking, how am I going to get the work done tomorrow? I'm going to ask who is going to get the work done tomorrow. And it started for him to this shift of, of, of empowering a labor force, start off with part-time apprentices and so forth. But he very quickly started to think of who's going to do the work. The second strategic thing that Mike did was he said, as he started to grow his shop and now he had like 20 contract, uh, 20 employees and 40 had hundreds when he sold the company. Um, he made the strategic decision of not having an office at his office. He says, I'm never going to work from there because the, every day that I'm at the office, I am, I'm the guy that they can go to and ask a question and I have a sense of obligation to answer it. So I became this kind of work knowledge base hmm. where people can come to me and ask question after question. He goes, the reliance on me remained just instead of me actually plugging in the outlets, I was giving people on direction on how to do this. So he says that was a tra trap. So I no longer had an office here and they became self-reliant. And those two elements moved him down this pathway to a business that ran itself and uh, business that ran itself says, you know, as his story tells is a very valuable business. And I think that one of the challenges is fear, you know, that it's, I think a business owner can get their arms around, around the concept that this is what I need to do, but the fear associated with doing it, or I'm going to lose income, or I can't, you know, I can't see that far that this will benefit me. I mean, you, you have any thoughts on, it or have you, have you coached or consulted with folks, you know, this just, you got to get over this hump. So the first step is yeah. like you said, you know, just, just do one thing. Well, okay. Yeah. How do you see, how do you see past that? Yeah. So first let me tell you what that's rooted in. So I am a amateur, if that's even the right word, uh, researcher on behavioral psychology. It, it is a passion of mine uh, on how our mind operates. And we have this cognitive bias, uh, it's called a primacy effect. And what the primacy effect is, is that when something is immediately in front of us, we put more value in it than when it's a far distance away. 
Um, maybe not a good example, but if I put a lollipop in front of you and you put it in your hand, or I have one that's two blocks down the road and I tell you it's sitting there, you're more likely to eat the one that's in your hand because it's easily accessible. Um, but a, probably a better example is money. If I say I can give you right now, I will put, you know, five thousand dollars in your hand, or if you're willing to wait a year, I can give you ten thousand dollars. Five thousand dollars cash right now in your hand, no questions asked. Or if you're willing to wait a year, I'll give you ten thousand dollars. Most people will revert to the five thousand dollars when, in fact, if I gave you six thousand dollars next year, that is way more valuable than five thousand today based upon current interest rates. So ten thousand is an absurd offer, mm -hmm. and it's the better choice. But are the primacy effects as a bird in hand is worth two in the bush. And so we're very oriented toward this immediate gain. So when it comes to work, we say, if I simply take this one action today of answering the questions my employees have, doing the work myself, it's just one day, um, I will get more gain from it. I make more money if I just do this just today. Um, but the thing is, you'll do it just tomorrow and just the day after, and it becomes a groundhog's day. We start repeating the same decision-making. I'll tell you two ways to get past this. One way is to um, look at your history. And if you have been in the mentality that if I just grind it out for a day, um, that my business will finally grow, how, ask yourself, how long, honestly, have you been grinding it out? And if you've been grinding it for more than a year, you've proven, you've proven that you can't grow a business by grinding if you're still grinding. Because it should, in a year, you should have been able to resolve itself. So your history will prove it. The, the second thing is to um, do a compression of rewards. And so I, I teach this in Profit First. I know that if I tell myself, Mike, this is me talking to myself now, Mike, you got to wait uh, 10 years and there's going to be a million dollar check waiting for you. Um, it, it is actually so far out that it's hard to believe and I can't take actions immediately. I also know if I say, Mike, you're going to get uh, you know $10,000 in hand today, but we're done that that is really damaging. So what I do is I stage or compress the time. So I say, listen, $7 million out 10 years from now, I'm going to stage rewards. So every quarter, I'm going to give you a portion of that reward and I'm going to give you growing momentum. So a little bit complex, but this is how it works with profit first because it's simple. My business collects its profit first. Every time revenue comes into my business, we immediately take our profit, cash profit, reserve it away. So I'm accumulating profit all the time. That's the mentality of the profit first system. It's the pay yourself first system simply applied to business. Now I have profit accumulating an account. Every quarter I go into that account and take a portion of it. Um, so I'm rewarding myself quarterly, but I don't take all the profit. I make sure that the business is based upon its trend positioned that the next quarter, the profit will be bigger. Now I've done this system for myself now for 11 years. And the very first time I took profit for my business, it was $8, which by the way was my probably the most exciting profit distribution I ever took in my life. <laughs> you know, how many small businesses take quarterly profit distributions? I took out $8 in cash. I made sure the bank teller did in all singles just so I felt like I had a wad. And then I went to Starbucks and spent it. But then I also knew I had more than $8 saved up in my profit account for the next quarter. Uh, and I didn't even contribute to it. Well, the next quarter came out and the money was about $16, uh, which I do a comparative. I'm like, hey, last quarter, only 90 days ago, was eight and I got 16. Well, then it became 32. And it kind of got this doubling effect for a period of time. I'm not going to share just, you know, because I think it's, it's personal information. The, the, the profitability is extraordinary. And, and the next one, as if it's a recording day, is less than 30 days away. I'm going to take more profit out than I ever have in my life. Um, and, and it is substantial. And, and the next quarter already is positioned to be more than that. So what I've done is instead of requiring myself to have, you know, defer the benefit for so long that I'm actually uh, disciplining myself uh, in a negative way, you know, anticipating, anticipating, I'm giving myself this trickle effect that's growing. And every time I get more and more excited. So that's this compression of time where you're kind of dripping out rewards to yourself and it builds this positive behavior toward what you want to achieve. Yeah, that that's interesting. And, and the funny thing is, um, when I, when I look at the, the formula, so you have the typical formula, sales, less expenses, equal profit versus the methodology today, which is sales, less profit equals expenses. So when I'm looking at it from a value standpoint and, and as we're positioning from a sale standpoint, you know, we're looking at multiples to, toward your earnings. Okay. So, so you have your earnings multiple, but where you get your biggest bang 
is in the operating expenses where you start essentially de-risking the company. And I'm trying, yeah. and what I'm trying to reconcile, because I know we're, we're running up against some time constraints is how through this methodology that you are either intentionally or unintentionally de-risking the company. So you're not only improving your value with your earnings that is increasing, but you're also de-risking the company because you're, you're more deliberate in facing your operating expenses. That makes sense. Yeah. Oh yeah. 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 And you're, and you're introducing efficiencies. So, so there's this fascinating trickle down effect. L- let me just give you some numbers first to, to back what I'm about to share. So profit first, I, I introduced the book, uh, five years ago, the concept I developed 11 years ago, I introduced the book five years ago, started an organization uh, of accountants and bookkeepers that actually are out there supporting businesses in this process. As of today, we have over 150,000 businesses globally that have implemented profit first are trending toward two over 200,000 by the end of 2019. And we have 3000 documented case studies on the profit first process. Here's the fascinating things we found from all this research and experience. Now, when a business takes its profit first, um, it, it forces the business to channel around the things that make profitability. So you take your profit first, there's less money to spend on expenses. So you have to cut expenses, de-risking the business. You have to focus on the stuff that bring true value. So it's not arbitrary anymore. It used to be hundred dollars came in. I would say I have a hundred dollars spent. Hey, let's do this Facebook ads. Everyone else is doing it. But now hundred dollars comes in. I'm taking a predetermined percentage of profit and, and, and allocating money to other purposes. I realized the true operating spend I have is not a hundred dollars. It may be $40. Now I'm like, well, I, I don't have enough money for that Facebook. So you start cutting costs, but you start becoming selective in what costs have a true ROI. Like if I spend something here, am I guaranteed a return? So that's part of it. The second part too is uh, these businesses realize over and over again that when you take your profit first, you have to run the business more efficiently to maintain the profit that you already took. So it builds in efficiency. And the ultimate way to achieve efficiency is through repeatability. Repeatability is where you serve the same. Listen, if I had one client ever that asked for the exact same thing every time and the problems were exactly the same every time, I would know how to solve it very quickly and I could become so efficient at it. So that should be our goal. Now it's not realistic to have a single client, but we can clone clients. That's called niche specialization. So businesses that take profit first have to build efficiency. They start finding that if they focus on a type of client that they have repeating problems and therefore they need a smaller set of solutions, niche specialization to, to solve it. And they become more masterful at the process because they repeat the same process. Kind of like a heart surgeon focuses on just heart surgery. He's not, he's not doing, you know, work on your foot or on your, your brain. Um, that doctor, she's just working on your heart and, and the consumer, the more heart surgeries successfully a person does is willing to pay more. You know, I don't want a heart surgeon that says, Hey, I've never done this before. This is my first attempt. Is you cool with that? I want a heart surgeon that says I've done 10,000 of these operations and, uh, all successfully. Are you in? I'm like, yeah. And I'll pay premium for that. True for our business too. When we specialize because we've taken our profit first, we become very efficient clients will start paying a premium because we are the proven solution provider. Totally get it. That no, I mean, it, that is exactly it. That, and the funny thing is you get, you get double bang for the buck. I mean, you, it's one thing to have earnings, but when you can increase your multiple as a result of less oh. risk, Oh my goodness. You, I mean, that's the best of both worlds. Oh yeah. There's no question. You know, a lot of valuations or there's different approaches. They'll look at EBITDA uh, and do a multiple of that. Some do it on revenue, um, um, but most in EBITDA. What I found is businesses that take the profit first uh, build one of the most important assets, actually the most important asset in the world, which is cash in the bank. You know, look at Apple. I think they have 5 billion of cash. That gives you such power and flexibility to grasp opportunity. Um, So you you go into a, a sales situation, you're sitting on tons of cash, puts you in a position of strength, don't need to sell it, you, you're your own bank and it's proven now to the acquirer that you have a cash creation system. Yeah. So they'll give you a multiple of a, of EBITDA plus those assets. So it really positions you for a high valuation. Yeah, totally agree. So a couple more questions. Do you, do you think today's business owners are, are more interested in lifestyle or legacy? Here's the crazy thing. I actually hope more are interested in lifestyle, but I got to define lifestyle. I, I my mentality you know, was, was the greed is good to the wall street shows like, and uh, that movie wall street where you know, grow, grow, grow and, and, and drive around an expensive car. Um, that's what I aspired to originally. And then when I lost all my money, I had a reset in life 
I found that, um, that that wasn't what lifestyle is to me. Lifestyle equates to joy. Like I, I just want to be happy and, uh, accumulation of wealth. I, I've been on both sides. I've been totally broke. I, I've been very wealthy and I'll tell you being very wealthy is better than being totally broke. <laughs> <laughs> I, I can attest to that. Um, but it's only an asset when you're in a joyous state. Um, you, you can be a miserable you can be living a miserable life and make tons of money. Your life will not become better. In fact, I found money is an amplifier of your state. So if you're miserable, actually more money can bring more misery. Uh, you, you can do research on these lottery winners of people that are at a very difficult life and, and they, they felt miserable in their life and they made money and it actually amplified problems for them. So lifestyle I think is joy. And I, I, I see more entrepreneurs going to business not to make tons of money, but are making a business that brings them internal satisfaction. They can see the impact they're having. Uh, it brings them wealth, but it's rooted in joy. Interestingly, I find that is translating into legacy. Now, how I'm defining legacy is that we are leaving a long lasting impact, perhaps something that can live e you know, centuries or decades past our own existence, existence on this planet. And uh, that's the state I believe I'm fully in now is that I've built businesses that bring me joy. I love working. Uh, I mean, just absolutely love it. Um, I see the impact I'm having and I'm positioning now that when I leave this planet, be it tomorrow or hopefully not for a while, but we'll see um, that th there, the businesses and the work I've done can now live beyond me. So living, living joyfully puts us in a position to have a long lasting legacy. I believe. Totally agree. Two things. Yeah. First is your next book, Fix This Next, is in process. So, yeah. so what's the book about? I mean, I kind of have an idea, but um, yeah. when's it going to be released? So I, I am so jacked about this book. I, mean, I, I can't tell you, I, this may be the most important book I've written to date. Um, readers will, will tell by, simply by, you know, do they love it or not? Um, but I, I, I'm so proud of this. I've, I've pinpointed what I think is the biggest challenge facing businesses. And the biggest challenge facing entrepreneurs is that they don't know what their biggest challenge is. It's the identification problems. Most entrepreneurs I've studied and I've experienced myself uh, focus on the apparent issues. There's always something that needs to be tackled. Uh, sometimes it's when you open your email in the morning that that prioritizes other things. It's the first person that yells the loudest, but there's always issues. And so we're in this constant fire extinguisher mode, just running around but that does not move a business forward. Most businesses take two steps forward, yet three steps back. And so what fix this next is, is a tool I developed to pinpoint where the next vital need is in your business that must be resolved. That next big roadblock and bust through it. And then you go through this process again to identify the next need. It's a way to really put an order of the, the things you need to do next. The, the challenge I found is, is with this kind of arbitrary, uh, approach to growing business is that entrepreneurs are overly reliant on instinct. And I was too, I would say, I trust my gut. My gut says this, here's what I found is our gut, our instincts are very valuable for self-preservation. Like if you or I are walking down a dark alley and our spidey sense says, uh, this is dangerous. Someone's going to kill us. Please, please turn around. Like someone likely is to kill you. Like <laughs> Right. We are neurologically wired into ourselves. Our senses trigger that and it's an extremely valuable asset. We are not, we are not neurologically wired into our business, yet we behave like we are we're like, Oh, my instinct says this is wrong. My instinct says we're losing prospects. So we need to you know, run those Facebook ads or whatever, but we're not neurologically wired in. And so our instincts can misfire or misdirect. What we need is some kind of validation, a way to analyze the data some compass that can complement our instinct. And so fix this next, which to your question comes out in April, 2020, uh, the manuscripts in it's done. It's just big stream mainstream publishing takes its time. Sure. Um, that this book is a compass to complement our instinct and navigate through the journey of entrepreneurship. You know what? And, and I, I'm so stoked that you're, you're doing, you're doing that because you know, the people that we consult with either, you know, they're disappointed in the value and they say, all right, I'm going to go back and, and work on, work on the business and, and most of them choose to, you know, I'm going to go at it alone or then they turn around and they say, you know, I, I screw that out. I want to sell it. So yeah. the, those that go back to the drawing board, you know, they, they need 
that roadmap. They think that they know. So this is this is a, a real timely thing because you know there's so many exits that are that are going to occur in the next decade or so that oh my goodness the to help a business owner determine what they need to do to amplify that value. Oh my gosh, that is that that's going to be a big win for them. Yeah, yeah, I hope so. <laughs> <laughs> I bet. Um so how how can someone work with you? Oh, well, thank you for letting me share. So um, I have kind of the starting point for, for different access points. I, I've been so blessed. I do a lot of main stage keynotes nowadays and, and uh, I have coaching organizations. I actually I coach myself and um, one little surprise I do for my readership is uh, well, once, sometimes twice a year, I'll just do a blast some weird time, maybe three o'clock in the morning on a Sunday to saying, first 50 people that respond, I'm inviting you uh, just to come to my offices and we're going to spend a day together. No cost, no nothing. Just get out here. And uh, we explore all the newest research. So the, the starting point for all that is uh, my website, mikemichalowitz.com. Here's the deal. No one can spell Michalowitz. My wife still struggles <laughs> with it. So uh, I have a shortcut. It's mikemotorbike.com. And uh, the little joke is my nickname in high school was Mike Motorbike because of the rhyme. The, the irony is I've never driven a motorcycle. I have no aspiration to, <laughs> but I'm Mike motorbike. So go to Mike motorbike.com. Um, that forwards you to my website and on there you'll see uh, an option that says get the tools. Uh, you can immediately get this chapters from my books all for free. I, I, I send this one page with always different links to every resource I have to get you started. And, uh, and plus you'll be on my list to get invited out and maybe we get some time to work together one-on-one. Fabulous. Well, I'll, I'll make sure that's in the, in the show notes. So Thanks, the, the last thing, the last thing I wanted to ask you is if you had one piece of advice that you would give the listeners that would have the most immediate impact on the value of their business, what would it be? Oh, well, if you want to increase the value of your business, you, it's, it is profitability first. It's the first stage to getting you extracting you from the business. That's, that's goal number two. But if you want a business that other people thirst after, start taking your profit first. And we laid out the system already start, but you can set this up within the next 60 minutes. I'll increase the value of your business. Next 60 minutes, go to your bank, whoever bank you work with today. If you enjoy working with them, keep working with them. Step two is set up a savings account at that bank um, and name it profit. And then the final step is start allocating. I would start with a small percentage, one or 2% of your income, very small. So there's no negative impact on how you're currently operating the business. Like if you do 1%, if $10,000 comes in today, I'm saying take a hundred bucks, uh, that's, that's 1% and put it into this profit account. And uh, that means you have 9,900 to operate the business. So there's no consequence on how you operate and how you're spending your cash. But the serious consequence is now you have profit, cash profit accumulating, and you'll start establishing this habit. And when it comes to the valuation of your business, if you have a proven profitable business, a, a business that's consistently accumulating profit, you have a far, far more valuable business. And literally now you know the system. You can start it today. It takes little effort and uh, you will start accumulating profit. And, and I know because we have so many businesses doing this now, over time, that 1% will become two or five or 15 or whatever. It will grow, but start small, but start today. Right on. Well, Mike, I can't tell you that how, how much I appreciate you being so generous with your time and experiences and you know helping business owners maximize their value. And thank you for joining the Defenders of Business Value podcast. If you're preparing your business for sale, visit LegacyTransitionAdvisors.com or text EXIT to 35893 to begin your journey to maximum saleable value. If you want more episodes packed with strategies to transfer maximum value in your business, visit DefendersOfBusinessValue.com. Better yet, subscribe now so you don't miss the future episodes. This program is copyright Legacy Transition Advisors, LLC. All rights reserved.